we should be owned as soldiers are by the army and our pride would rise accordingly. Welcome to Philosophers, explained by me, Stephen Hicks. This series covers major philosophers and core texts in philosophy, especially the great classics, which are classics for good reason. From each, I've selected an excerpt, 20 to 40 minutes, no more than an hour. And the idea is to have an introduction to an important work. We'll do a close reading with the accompanying text. In this episode, we're turning to William James, the American philosopher, usually labeled a pragmatist, and his 1906 essay, The Moral Equivalent of War. At this point, World War I is a few years still in the future. The Panama Canal has not yet been opened, but the American philosopher William James is thinking about issues of war and peace philosophically on a global scale. Let's go to the text. All right, let's start at the beginning. The war against war is going to be no holiday excursion or camping party. Now, James uh, talks about the American context and even more broadly the world context at the beginning of the 20th century. He then goes on to note that in the fourth line here, there's something highly paradoxical in the modern man's relation to war. And he gives an example then from uh, recent American history, uh, the Civil War, which had ended only one gen uh, generation, uh, generation previously. James is writing in 1906, and uh, the Civil War had ended in the middle part of the 1860s. So the way he puts it here, if you were to ask our millions, North and South, whether they would vote now to have our war for the Union expunged from history. That is to say, suppose the war had never happened. Would you now uh, like for that war never to have happened? And he says, most people would say no. The way he puts it here is only a handful of eccentrics would say yes. And the reason for that is that that war has become an important part of American history, memories and legends and even pride. And then even more strongly than that, it has become a sacred spiritual possession in American and even more broadly world history. So we don't want that war not to have happened yet. And here's the other side of the paradox. Ask those same people whether they would be willing to start another civil war to go uh, uh, for the same reasons or whatever. And all of them would say, no, absolutely no. Not one man or woman would vote for the proposition. And the reason seems to be uh, that there has been a change psychically in the modern world. We no longer think about war and value war in the way that we did for most of human history. And that moral change is uh, given in the last sentence here. Only when forced upon one is a war now thought to be permissible. So the modern ethics, and particularly the American ethic, as he's speaking from the American context, is to say, essentially, war is moral only in self-defense. Other reasons are no longer legitimate. And that could be argued as a sign of moral progress in the modern world. He then goes on to contrast the moderns to ancient times. Why did people go to war in ancient times? Well, for, for lots of reasons. Uh, they, they, uh, in ancient times, men were hunting men. Uh, they liked to hunt the neighboring tribes as well as animals. They liked to kill. They liked to loot. They liked to take as many women as they possibly could. And this was highly profitable, but also it was exciting. It brought out that was uh, the, the, that feeling of, of manly. And he goes on then to sound an evolutionary point. Why did some tribes survive and why did some tribes not survive? He says, well, if you're not willing to fight and if you don't even enjoy fighting, chances are very good you're not going to survive evolutionarily. So thus were the more martial tribes selected and in chiefs and in people. And now interesting here, a kind of biological point, perhaps an evolutionary point, about uh, how this affected what it meant to be a human being, a point deep in human nature. In chiefs and people, a pure pugnacity and the love of glory came to mingle with the more fundamental appetite for plunder. So what has happened as a result of this long history, this uh, going back to ancient times, of human martial 
uh, uh, ambition is that we have in us uh, these appetites that are part of our human nature to, to just fight, to be pugnacious, the love of glory that can come from war, and of course, just to get stuff to plunder, to take uh, uh, as much as we possibly can. But that has changed in the modern world. Uh, partly because we are much more commercial, we're much more capitalist, we're much more free market traders in the modern world, and this has brought with it a new ethic. Uh, we don't like to just waste money on, on, on those sorts of things. So we feel trade to be a better avenue to plunder, whatever it is that we want to acquire. Let's get it not by conquering people and taking their stuff, let's get it by trading with the, with people. But even though we do have this new modern attitude overlaying human nature, modern man inherits still all the innate pugnacity and all the love of glory of his ancestors. It hasn't changed our underlying inheritance uh, biologically and psychologically from those many, many generations and millennia of war likeness. And then he gives us a brief history lesson over the course of the next page or so, page or so, uh, pages rather, or so. If we uh, get your know, standard, the, the, the standard curriculum that educated people would be, uh, would be uh, exposed to, it's just war, war, war. Of course, there are other things that happen in there, but uh, uh, war takes pride of place. So the way he puts it somewhat rhetorically, history is a bath of blood. Okay, now that's some very strong language. It's not that there's lots of blood. It's a bath of blood. You're just immersed in, in, in blood. Now, there's an interesting question about whether history is only a bath of blood, whether there are other interesting things going on in arts and science and family life and and travel and, uh, and other aspects of culture as well. But nonetheless, there is a significantly uh, dominant element of war in history as it is written. Uh, <clears throat> one of the foundational texts in the Western canon, Homer's Iliad, it's just a killing spree, war, 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 all the way through. And all of the great heroes in it are warriors, uh, Ajax, Diomedes, Sarpedon, Hector, uh, are, are, are killed, and we have uh, Achilles and Agamemnon and all of all of the rest. Uh, a few centuries later, uh, in the rise to the to the Peloponnesian War in the early stages of it, the Athenians uh, uh, basically play power politics. We're strong, you're weak with respect to the Melians, and uh, when the Melians resist, they are just brutally suppressed. Uh, and the Athenians make no bones about it. This is just the way things are. This is the way uh, gods have uh, have made made the world. Uh, a couple of generations, Alexander the Great. Well, what was he great about? Well, just conquest, war, killing. And the way he puts it here is Alexander's career was piracy, pure and simple. And then the Romans, uh, they rise up, they conquer Greece, they conquer basically most of the known world at that time and so on. So we just march through the centuries. We march through the millennia and it's war, war, war. This shapes our consciousness. This shapes also our biology. And it's this biology that he emphasizes in the next paragraph. We inherit the war-like type. You know, the, the kind of males, for example, who didn't want to go to war, uh, if they were more naturally timid, well, they are not the ones who are going to get the loot. They're not the ones who are going to get the woman. It's the, the man who is successful at war and enjoys war. He is the one who's going to get all of the rewards of war and then be the one to pass on his genes. So we are the inheritors of that type, the war-like type. So uh, that uh, uh, concept of inheritance uh, biologically is is uh, emphasized again a few sentences later. Our ancestors have bred pugnacity into our bone and marrow. And thousands of years of peace won't breed it out of us. So it's in us biologically. It's an inheritance and we can't just talk ourselves out of it. Uh, uh, and, and even if we were to do breeding for several generations to try to breed it out, that breeding for several generations is going against the breeding of multiples of millennia. <clears throat> even in modern times, 
Uh, he mentions the Boer War. He mentions McKinley, the American president who was assassinated, but the American president uh, 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 had been uh, uh, the one to inaugurate the uh, the span the war with Spain over over Mexico a few years earlier, and uh, uh, you know it was a, a relatively a, a short war. But what he's uh, pointing out here is that even in capitalist democratic times, uh, you know the the, uh, the the early America, and even in an America sickened by the memory of the Civil War just a generation earlier, there still is this thrill and attraction of war, and politicians in a democracy can't resist that. So whatever McKinley's private views were, the way he puts it here is in 1898, our people had read the word war in letters three inches high for three months in every newspaper. So the newspapers and the people are clamoring for war, and in a democracy, ultimately, uh, 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 the, the politics delivers what the people want, and so McKinley has to, has to go along with. So that then is to say, in present day, right, our civilized opinion is a curious mental mixture. Right? On the one hand, we still have all of these military instincts. They are, as he puts it, as strong as ever, but they are confronted by a reflective criticism. So on the intellectual side of things, which are trying to curb them, to try to limit them. And the idea that we're just going to go out and fight war for, and it's just in order to dominate and take stuff, that is no longer an allowable motive in our culture. We want pre-peace and we prize peace and there might be some hypocrisies and some uh, some qualifications built into none of that, but nonetheless that is a part of our moral consciousness. And so we are kind of dual creatures. We are attracted to war at the same time we are repelled by war and that's where we are. So what does the uh, program of pacifism, those people, and James counts himself among them, who are genuinely interested in peace, who want to make war a thing of the past? It is very interesting, uh, the idea of a peace movement, the idea that peace could be a thing of the past is a relatively modern invention. You don't find it seriously articulated until the 1800s, as we are well into modern democratic republican capitalism free market trading type of era. And so uh, what we have then is James saying, what we want is to continue down that road toward pacifism, but we need to have better arguments if we are in fact going to succeed in the program. And his question is why the pacifist program has not been more successful. And instead of blaming the militarist types and the people who like uh, like war and blaming biology, interestingly, what James does is to say, I'm a pacifist, but really the major problem is with the way we pacifists have been making our case. And that's this sentence rather in the middle. I believe that the difficulty is due to certain deficiencies in the program of pacifism. So what are those deficiencies? So in his remarks, he then goes on to say, he declares himself in the next paragraph as a pacifist. He says, I'm not going to do what pacifists typically do, which is just to say, oh, you military types, you're just beasts, you're just animals, and to try to shame them and guilt them into them. So he says, I'm not going to do that. I will refuse to speak of the bestial side of the war regime. Instead, what I am going to do is, and the way he puts it here is, consider only the higher aspects of militaristic sentiment. In what sense can war be an ideal, a high-minded sentiment, a moral principle, uh, a, a great value that should be advocated such that it is attractive to certain sorts of people who then we might want to label as militaristic individuals. So we need to take seriously that there are high-minded arguments that can be made for war. So patriotism is one such thing. You know, it's not a discreditable uh, moment. And uh, the idea that war has a certain romance about it. Uh, we can't deny that war does have that romance about it. And when we turn to people who are seriously into uh, uh, military history, military war, 
foreign policy in which war is a realistic option. We can't just dismiss them as unthinking thugs and, and, and bestial animals who just like to go out and, and rip and tear on, on other people. So <clears throat> the militarily patriotic and the romantic minded everywhere, and especially the professional military class. They refuse to admit for a moment that war may be a transitory phenomenon in social evolution. It's not just a thing of the past. And interestingly, uh, when you put to them the alternative, that alternative is not very attractive to them. The notion of a sheep's paradise like that revolts, they say, our higher imagination. So, okay, maybe you don't think war is a very nice thing, and we will agree with you that war is not a very nice thing, but what would a war be like with, uh, or sorry, the world be like without without war? Is it that we're just supposed to be sheep? You know, uh, sheep are, don't really go to war, but you know, they don't lead very interesting lives, and they're not particularly admirable animals uh, from the perspective of most of us. They just like to, you know, munch on their grass and, 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 and make baby sheeps, and they're scared of the big bad wolf and they stay together in herds but you know is that what we want just to turn human beings into a kind of sheep and if so uh, maybe we're not particularly interested in in that that's not a moral ideal that's not particularly high minded uh, James then goes on to point out that many apologists for war and advocates for war will argue for war on religious grounds uh, reflective uh, apologists for war at the present day all take it religiously. And that religiously is a bit uh, uh, the double meanings here, as he's going, to, going to, uh, to indicate a little bit later. Not necessarily religious in the official sense of there's a god and god has chosen, uh, you know, takes sides in various wars or is using war for godly purposes. That's one possibility. But also religiously in that sense of uh, something that one is seriously committed to as a high set of ideals, whether those high ideals involve gods or or not. And the idea here is, the way he puts it, from the perspective of reflective apologists of war, quite apart from any question of profit, maybe you know we, we can be profitable and we will we'll, we'll make some money from it, but independently of that, it, war, is an absolute good, we are told, for it is human nature at its highest dynamic. And then he goes on to say, well, what does it mean to say human nature at its highest dynamic? One suggestion down here, militarism is the great preserver of our ideals of hardihood, being tough, being willing to and able to, uh, to undergo privations of food and sleep and, 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 and the comforts of a, of a warm bed, to go out and uh, screw up one's courage uh, in, in the face of hard obstacles uh, and so on, uh, being the kind of human being. Uh, who can strive for that ideal and embody that ideal? Well, the military life prizes that. Human life with no use for hardihood would be contemptible. We don't, we're not going to admire human beings if they're soft and passive and they can't handle you know, any challenge and they have no courage to face up to, to diff difficult things as well. So uh, uh, there is then a strong connection between military virtue and virtue in general, our ideal of what we take a human being at his or her best to, to be. Now, uh, some will then go on <clears throat> to, uh, uh, to argue even mystically the way he puts it here. Without exception known to me, militaristic, uh, militarist authors take a highly mystical view of their uh, subject and regard war as a biological or sociological necessity. That is to say, it's something necessary to our biological existence, but also an expression of our biological nature, but then also sociologically. If we are going to have a healthy, dynamic society, war needs to be a part of it. All right. When the time of development is ripe, the war must come. Reason or no reason for the justifications pleaded are invariably fictions. And he then cites an American general, war is in short a permanent human obligation. It's not transitory, it's not optional, it is permanent and it is an obligation. And 
This is uh, uh, James having read uh, Homer Lee's The Valor of Ignorance. Now, he then gives a sketch of Lee's argument. He says there is uh, kind of a growth cycle uh, to, uh, to, uh, to nations and, and, and to culture. They can expand, they can shrink, just as biological can ex uh, life can expand or shrink. Uh, nations, General Lee says, are never stationary. Uh, so there's an imperative here. They must necessarily expand or shrink according to their vitality or decrepitude. And since there are many nations out there, uh, the nations that are, are, are expanding will be expanding at the expense of the nations that are shrinking. And the nation that has entered into a period of decline is just setting itself up for being conquered by one of the nations that is expanding. So he uh, cites <clears throat> uh, General Lee's example of Japan and General Lee's worry that America uh, morally and in terms of its uh, social culture is in a decline phase while Japan is is expanding. Japan has been expansionist with respect to China, with respect to Russia, with respect to several islands in the Pacific Ocean, which is the barrier between America and, and, and the United States. And so Japan seems to be on an increasingly vigorous, expansionistic, more militaristic direction. And then what does the USA have to author, offer by contrast? What kind of culture is the, is the US? And the way uh, uh, James puts it here, glossing on Homer Lee, is to say, America is nothing but our conceit. You know, we're special, right? Our ignorance, we don't really know what's going on. Our commercialism, we're just a nation of shopkeepers and so forth. Our corruption and our feminism. All right, so the idea here is from this militaristic perspective, we're trying to make men more feminine. Uh, the idea that they were all equal, et cetera, et cetera. And that seems to be a lessening of the manly virtues that have dominated human history. And none of that is going on in Japan at the same time. We're interested in just making stuff and having our nice shops and nice restaurants. That's all of our commercialism. Meanwhile, you don't find that in Japan. Japan is prizing military accomplishment and valorizing its samurai, even though the samurai are to some extent a thing of the past and so on. So uh, what's going to happen if Japan and America goes to war? And then General Lee is saying, look, <laughs> we, uh, we probably would lose quickly uh, uh, and, uh, and, and, and with, uh, with a great deal of shame. So Lee is not particularly a religious for, for person, but they're arguing here just as a biological and sociological necessity, we Americans need to be ready for war. And that means we can't be pacifist. And so James says this is an argument we need to take seriously. Now, there are other authors, though, who will upgrade even further the religious elements of war. And for this, he goes to <clears throat> a German philosopher of war. Steinmetz, war, according to this author, is an ordeal instituted by God. Let me repeat that again for emphasis. War is an ordeal instituted by God. So war is not just a biological necessity and not just a matter of the organic rise and falls of nations and others and societies. Rather, war is God's way of uh, playing favorites sometimes in, in the world. War is God's way of uh, testing the virtues of human beings. So the way he puts it here, it's, uh, uh, it's a matter of virtue, a totality of virtues uh, that God is looking for. And then a little bit later, it's God weighing nations in its balances when God holds his assizes and hurls the people upon one Another. Now, of course, religious justifications for war have a long tradition, and in this case, they had been uh, revivified uh, in uh, 19th century German philosopher, uh, uh, philosophers, rather, uh, many of them hearkening back to, uh, to Hegel and uh, historians like Treitschke and others. Uh, and so Steinmetz is, uh, is, from James's perspective, a contemporary exponent of 
that. So again, we'll have the question from the American perspective, we might say commerce and peace and let's be nice to each other and be more feminist, et cetera, et cetera. Where's that going to stand if Germany rises up and Germany believes it has a God-given mission to, uh, to, uh, to expand its territory and to demonstrate its, its uh, religious and military prowess in the world. So James then goes on to argue this is what pacifists need to take more seriously. So uh, in this uh, highlighted section here, one cannot meet them, that is to say those arguments, effectively by mere counter-insistency on war's expensiveness and horror. So you take the arguments that are being uh, argued by Lee and by Steinmetz, or how they are portraying, say, the Japanese mind or the German mind, and just say, oh, no, war is too expensive, or war is just so terrible, and all these nasty things happen. Those kinds of arguments will have zero traction uh, uh, in, in those contexts. And that's what James's point is here. Pacifism makes no converts from the military party. The military party neither denies the bestiality nor the horror, nor the expense. Yes, it's bestial. Yes, it's horrific. Yes, it is expensive. It says only that these things tell but half the story. It only says war is worth them. It's a values issue, and the military party is holding up certain values as higher than peaceful values. So James argues then, uh, as a next intermediate step, pacifists ought to enter more deeply into the aesthetical and ethical point of view of their opponents. Rather than just saying, oh, our opponents have no aesthetics, they have no ethics, and just dismissing them, that's seriously to underestimate one's adversary. So, Next implication, so long as anti-militarists propose no substitute for war's disciplinary function, no moral equivalent of war, hence the title of the argument. What the pacifists need to do is to have an equivalent set of ideals or a moral equivalence uh, to counter the militaristic equivalent ideals. And we can't just say they don't have ideals. They do have ideals. We have to recognize those ideals from the pacifist perspective and have better ideals to offer in their place. Now, he then says there are a few pacifists who have been doing this uh, sort of thing. Tolstoy's pacifism he mentions. Uh, but uh, he says Tolstoy is an extraordinary pessimistic uh, with respect to uh, this world and, 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 and human aspirations in, uh, in the natural world. And so all he does is, uh, uh, is, uh, is, is offer a kind of religious, otherworldly alternative. Uh, and that's not going to be uh, particularly effective on all of the people who are not particularly uh, religious. And then uh, uh, James is going to count most socialists in that category. Our socialist peace advocates all believe absolutely in this worldly, this world's value. So Tolstoy and otherworldliness is perhaps not the road that we want to go. And so what we then have is a great moral conflict between two ideal lives. And he puts it nicely and dramatically in this next paragraph, quoting uh, Frederick the Great when Frederick the Great was rallying the troops. Dogs, would you live forever? And the idea is, no, you don't necessarily want to live forever. What you want to live is a glorious life, even if it is a shorter life and a military uh, a campaign is exactly the same sort of thing that will give you that glorious life. And then James is juxtaposing to that our utopians who are just saying, well, we just want to, to live forever and, and improve things a little bit. And that's not going to get anybody's blood stirred up. Now, James then uh, wants to argue that the pacifists who are, uh, let's live like sheep and just be nice and slowly incrementally change, those people are ultimately going to be ineffective just as the otherworldly religious, let's just kind of hope in another world the lion can lie down with the lamb, are going to be completely ineffective. What James wants to do is to say that the militarists have the better in terms of the virtues and the values of obligation that they are trying to instill in human beings. And so James wants to, uh, uh, wants to share some common ground with the militarists on that point, but disagree with them about how best to 
achieve or what the only methods are for achieving those. So notice what he does here in this very important sentence. This is James now uh, uh, announcing his conception of what the moral life is going to involve. All the qualities of man acquire dignity when he knows that the service of the collectivity that owns him needs him. So service, collectivism, ownership by one's society and their needs providing claims of obligation. When one recognizes that as one's moral code and internalizes and acts upon it, then a human being acquires dignity. So what James is doing is arguing that that collectivistic ethic of service uh, and obedience to uh, uh, to to the collective, the military ethic has that right, and James is going to uh, going to accept it. Now he then goes on to uh, speak in his own voice. I will now confess my own utopia. I devoutly believe in the reign of peace and in the gradual advent of some sort of socialistic equilibrium. Uh, but I do not believe, carrying on in the next paragraph, that peace either ought or will be permanent on the globe unless the states specifically organized preserve some of the old elements of army discipline. A permanently successful peace economy cannot be a simple pleasure economy. So what the what the free market capitalists are talking about, they're saying, yeah, we believe in the capitalist place. We want to make stuff and trade with people and pursue happiness and enjoy life's pleasures. That's not the right ideal from James's perspective. Uh, that is pacific, but it's not the right kind of pacificness. Uh, uh, it doesn't have the right ethic. And so the militarists, they have uh, uh, the, the, the right kind of ethic. They just don't have the right means of bringing that about. So what James is going to want to do is to take the military ethic and combine it with a peaceful economy. Uh, it can't be a simple pleasure economy. In the more or less socialistic future which mankind seems to be drifting, we must still subject ourselves collectively to those severity. So it's going to be a socialism that is collectivist. Well, that's uh, 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 built into the definition of socialism. It's not your individual pursuit of happiness and your individual freedom that matters. It is rather your service to the collective, uh, your obligation and willingness to sacrifice for the collective. But at the same time, socialism is not going to be some sort of nice kumbaya, let's get together on the commune and all share our stuff. It is going to be a severe kind of socialism. Um, the martial virtues, James goes on to argue, these must be combined with socialism. Martial virtues must be the enduring cement, intrepidity, contempt for softness, surrender of private interest, obedience to command must still remain the rock upon which the states are built. So, he goes on then to say, the war party is assuredly right in affirming and reaffirming that the martial virtues, although originally gained by the race through war, are absolute and permanent. So they have the right ethic. What they don't have is the right means of uh, or, or institutional vehicle through which to realize that. So uh, why not find some other way of taking those martial virtues and putting them to some social slash socialistic end? And this is James's ultimate policy proposal, which he uh, goes on to indicate highlighted here in the blue. If now, and this is my idea, there were, instead of a military conscription, a conscription of the whole youthful population to form for a certain number of years a part of the army enlisted against nature. So what many nations will do is to say, we own you to their youth, and then for a certain number of years, uh, you have to do what we tell you, and we are going to train you for military service, and you have to obey, uh, uh, and we might, of course, go to war, and you might, uh, uh, might suffer. But uh, what James then wants to do is to say, let's take exactly that. You, young people, we own you. You belong to the nation, but instead of conscripting them for military purposes, we are going to uh, conscript them into an army against nature. 
and to basically put them to work for the state for a certain number of years. And so he goes on to list the kinds of jobs, to coal and iron mines, to freight trains, to fishing fleets in December, to dishwashing, clothes washing, window washing, road building, tunnel making, and so on and so forth. So we take all of the young people, we draft them, uh, uh, and we assign them jobs for a certain number of years. Then what is this going to do for the young people? They would have paid their blood tax, done their own part in the immemorial human warfare against nature. So it's war, but not against other nations, but rather against nature. They would then acquire a certain amount of dignity. They would tread the earth more proudly. The women would value them more highly. They would be better fathers and teachers of the following nation. And so here he is saying, I speak of the moral equivalent of war. So far, war has been the only force that can discipline a whole community. And until the equivalent or an equivalent discipline is organized, I believe that war must have its way. So what we then should do is uh, take all of the state power, and the state is going to have a great deal of centralized power, uh, 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 just as it does during a wartime, but maintain that state power according to a socialist ideal uh, in times of peace. Take all of the energies of young people and direct them toward a different purpose. So we will get the values to the community from it, and at the same time, we will be instilling in humans young people particularly, that ethic of service, obligation, sacrifice, and putting the collectivity above their own interests. So he then wants to conclude, we can solve the problem of war uh, uh, and nonetheless retain the attractive parts that have led people to see war as the only solution. The martial type of character can be bred without war. Uh, we should all feel some degree of its imperative if we were conscious of our work as an obligatory service to the state. So that's the socialism coming out. Uh, it's an imperative. You do not own yourself. Your life is not your own. You should not be a free agent, pursuit of happiness. Very interesting that an American philosopher is uh, articulating these kind of non-declaration of independence my life, my liberty, my pursuit of happiness as a foundational set of ideals. Rather, it is uh, uh, that ethic of service to the state and obligation. Uh, I've put in green this next sentence. We should be owned as soldiers by the army. And that, again, is very striking to me. James is writing this one generation after the Civil War. Uh, and the Civil War was largely fought over the issue of slavery and against the ideal that uh, some human beings should be owned by, by other human beings. And so what we have here is, uh, interestingly, uh, one of the great moral conflicts of modern time between the ideal that individuals, all of them, should be free and equal in their rights to pursue their own happiness, to own their own life. And what James is arguing for is an ethic that says, in fact, as he puts it here, we should be owned a kind of slavery for, albeit for a short period of time, he doesn't specify how many years we should be owned by the, by the society, and that rather than our own happiness and our own liberties being paramount, rather uh, this ownership and service and sacrifice for the state is his ideal. 